Uh, so welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Joe and I'm the chairperson for the Royal Institute of Navigation's Younger Members Group. And I'm going to briefly introduce to you who the Younger Members Group or the YMG are and explain how we are part of the RIN, uh, the Royal Institute of Navigation. So the outline to this introduction, I'm going to talk first about how the YMG's goals fit within the RAN strategy, and then how the YMG fits within the RAN itself, uh, followed by some opportunities of joining the RAN, and then talk to you about where we are now and where we're heading uh, as the younger members group. And finally, if you're interested, how you can sign up. So the Royal Institute of Navigation, uh, the RIN, is a learned society and a professional body for navigation. Its mission is to unite in one body those interested in navigation. The younger members group particularly wants to unite young people from industry, academic and recreational backgrounds. The RIN's vision is to be an inclusive group of diverse disciplines working together for a more navigable world. The YMG wants to include any and every young person with an interest in navigation and who's interested in the Royal Institute of Navigation. Generally, the YMG exists to help young people explore the Royal Institute of Navigation as a professional body and decide whether the RIN is the right fit for them and their interests and their career. So where does the YMG fit within the RIN? Well, within the RIN structure, there are special interest groups and there are branches. Special interest groups run events for people with specific interests in specific areas of navigation. So, for example, we've got a cognitive navigation group, uh, animal navigation and a small craft group. Branches on the other side of the diagram allow people living in similar regions to meet up at local events. Um, and RIN members can be part of as many or as few as these special interest groups and branches as they want. The younger members group falls as a special interest group. However, because our members have a wide range of interests and localities, the YMG is supported across the whole RAN and encourages its members to engage with their local branches or with any spe special interest groups they might be interested in. So the opportunities for YMG members stem from the RIN strategy to be a diverse and inclusive learning society that promotes growth and development. As such, opportunities include developing academic industry connections and networks, influencing the RIN and its activities, and access to events, training and resources. There are also opportunities for you to develop your career and CV, whether it be through working with us to develop and manage your own events, or through pursuing a Royal Institute of Navigation route to professional registration. And uh, Ed is going to be talking more about professional registration later on. And there'll also be opportunities to access and engage with the Journal of Navigation, which uh, Anna will also be talking more about later on. So where is the YMG now and where is it going? The YMG started with a small group of young people interested in navigation and the Royal Institute of Navigation as a professional body. Now we're a growing community that engages with RIN branches and special interest groups. We attend and contribute to events and send monthly newsletters and events updates to our members. The group is currently run by a small committee of young people representing both academia and industry. But in the future, the aim is that the YMG is member-led, meaning that its members are encouraged to create their own events um, and even potentially sub-branches or special interest groups of their own within the RIN. And our members are supported by the YMG committee who will act to facilitate the needs of the YMG members and help them communicate with the RIN and wider networks. So I hope that brief uh, introductory presentation was useful in helping explain who the YMG are and what we do. 
And if you haven't already, and you are a young professional or a student, or just a young person interested in navigation, please sign up to our YMG mailing list, which you can find at the bottom of our webpage, uh, which is on the screen, ran.org.uk slash younger members group, or you can send, scan the code and go straight there. And for people signed up to the mailing list straight after this event, there will be a younger members group online social event where you can meet fellow YMG members, um, ask the committee or any of the younger members presenting today any questions you might have. Um, if you're already signed up to the YMG, you should have already received a link today to that event after this event. Um, or if you just signed up now or want to sign up during this these series of presentations, then you should receive an email link shortly after you sign up. So thanks for that. And now we'll move to the main part of our evening where Sapida and Ahmed, who are both YMG members, talk, will talk about their PhDs and their interests in navigation and how they've navigated the last year with respect to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so up next we have Sapida. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to talk about my research a little bit to you. Uh, so, okay, first about me a little bit, then about my research. I uh, am almost second year PhD student. I joined last February, February 2020, uh, just two weeks before the lockdown. So everything became awkward afterwards. Everything went online. Nobody knew how to manage meetings and everything. Thankfully, it's settled down now. I joined the Intelligent Vehicle Group in WMG University of Warwick under supervision of Professor, Professor Mehrdad Dianati. I work, as I said, uh, in the Intelligent Vehicle Group. So our main focus is autonomous driving systems. But what are they? It's uh, lots of modules that make the autonomous driving systems possible. Uh, but you can here see a summary of uh, basic functions in these driving systems, which uh, starts with sensors, perception sensors here, sensing the environment or getting data from uh, onboard systems or offboard systems. Then this raw uh, data is passed to the perception uh, module, which has different tasks like localizing the vehicle in the world or in a road, object detection, classification, and tracking, or basically answering the question of, where is the vehicle or what is around it? And then this data is passed to the control module, which uh, is in charge of tasks like mission planning, decision making and trajectory planning. But where I'm working in within this uh, vast field is basically the localization part. So the ultimate goal of the driving system is to navigate through the world and I'm focused on the localization part of it. Or more specifically, my research is on localization integrity monitoring for autonomous vehicles. You might ask what is integrity? It's basically how much is the position estimate of the localization module trustworthy? Also, the integrity monitoring system should be capable of pro, uh, issuing an alarm, a timely alarm, if it should not be trusted. If I want to give you a, a simple example, uh, just consider this road where the localization module estimates the position of the vehicle to be here. But in fact, the vehicle is here. You can see what kind of threats it can pose to the uh, passengers or other road users here. Let me know if you're interested in this topic. Thank you for listening. Next presenter is Ahmed. Ahmed. Okay, thank you, Spede. Um, so uh, now we move on to my presentation. Um, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Ahmed. I am a PhD student at the University of Nottingham in my final year. Um, so for today, um, I will be talking about my PhD briefly, and then I will talk about um, the main presentation subject, which is the root choices of blind and partially sighted people in outdoor journeys. And then I will move on to how I navigated the world last year with um, COVID and pandemic impact. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, my PhD, uh, my PhD is part of Horizon Doctoral Training Program and it's a multidisciplinary subject um, at the University of Nottingham in partnership with Royal National Institute of Blind People and Satellite Applications Catapult. 
So the subject of my PhD lies down mainly in between of uh, navigation technology from satellite applications catapult and personal data from Horizon. And um, blind and partially sighted people community are the ones that are targeted in my research uh, from the RNIB site. So um, basically that's about my PhD. And I would like to tell you some facts about um, sight loss and blind and partially sighted people before I move on to the uh, root choices. So in the UK, there are around 360,000 blind and partially sighted people who are officially registered. Um, about 50% are blind and 50% partially sighted. And interestingly, the vast majority of blind and partially sighted people can still see a little bit or have some residual vision of some sort, whether it's useful or not. Um, so the main cause of blindness is actually called age-related macular degeneration. And these are the, like the, all the generation are the ones of the majority of blind and partially sighted people um, in the UK. Um, in terms of the support and trainings available to them, so uh, mainly the rehabilitation trainers are providing mobility training for um, to help them navigate independently. And the main tools that are used uh, are a long cane. And also, if they are lucky, they can get a guide dog because there is a high demand on guide dog. And because of the familiarity with using technology, only the working age and the younger ones are trying to use the technology like mobile applications like Google Maps, Apple Maps, and Soundscape, and all the other um, tools are that are around in the market. Uh, so now we move on to the next slide. And um, so uh, now I'm talking about the root choices of blind and partially sighted people. And that's really an interesting um, uh, subject here because um, if you think of navigation of blind and partially sighted people, the main issue is with the sight, which is vision is one of the key elements of looking around and observing the surrounding and learning about the environment and dealing with real time challenges and issues when we are going out and about. So for blind and partially sighted people, it will be really difficult to learn about the environment using alternative senses. And it needs a lot of skills and mental workload and to navigate. So that's one of the issues like challenges that uh, like make many of them that stay at home and not getting out unless it's absolutely necessary and not like being independent. And the other thing is actually the design itself. So the design of the uh, environment that is done by, mainly done by sighted people, that's what is making the life difficult for them and like making them not being able to accessible the, access the services and navigate independently. So if you look at the picture here, that's in Nottingham near the university, you can see that there is some construction work going on on the footpath and the pavement is blocked. And there's only like a sign that tells, but how, how, how can a blind or partially sighted person know about that? And then the alternative is to cross an uncontrolled crossing, which is one of the biggest nightmares for blind people. And so actually then the choices are really difficult and it's really risky to deal with that such scenario. And that's an example that happens um, just like I saw it and took a picture uh, of it. So part of my PhDs, I've done interviews and focus groups with blind and partially sighted people to learn about their and preferences, uh, needs, and challenges, and requirements, and so that we know how to best enable them and navigate independently and enhance their journeys. So just as a brief like uh, a finding about the uh, one of my studies, so in terms of the root choices for blind and partially sighted people, so out of 20 people I interviewed, nine, pe nine, nine persons, individuals, said about um, like they want to go through the safest route. So safest for blind and partially sighted people means mainly not having uncontrolled crossings and less left and right, like less, less turning points and also avoiding construction and work areas. And only five people out of 20 have mentioned like they, won't be, they will be selecting the fastest route. 
Um, so when it comes to sighted people, we usually just select the route that we prefer and we just go for it with little concern about such uh, like um, points or like hot spots within the journeys like crossings. We just look around and we go. But for blind people, that will be really difficult, particularly with new technologies like electric cars, which they cannot hear the noise of the engine to learn which side of the road it's coming from. So there are lots of new challenges as well to be introduced. Um, so it's mainly about level of confidence and the skills they have. So the road choices is mainly about these two critical points here. Um, so now let's move on to the next slide, which is about navigating the last year during the pandemic. So if you, if you look at the first picture, so I bought this shirt uh, in the market before anything happens and there was nothing about uh, coronavirus going on. And interestingly, it, it became an interesting design because first it is covering you up when you need it. And then if you look at the zip design, it can go under the arm and you can use it for vaccination. Uh, so actually, in terms of the effect of uh, COVID on my personal life, um, so studying at home was really difficult for me because I have a little daughter, as you can see, she is using my desk and she is doing her own research. So that was one of the things that slowed down my progress. And also, like, uh, one of the key things that happened in my life was losing my mother during the uh, pandemic and not being able to go back to my home country. So I am from Kurdistan region of Iraq. So like attending the funeral until it was three months later because borders were closed and travel difficulties. Um, so personally, it was really difficult for me uh, to go through the last year. In terms of research, navigation of blind and partially sad people, it's clear that the subject itself tells like how it will be difficult to deal with such research. And for a blind and partially sad people community, when it comes to the pandemic, like doing field works or like a company journeys and things like that will be almost impossible because of the safety and risk uh, assessment. So I, have to, I had to move on to switching to online studies and then looking at learning about what studies make is best for them and in terms of accessibility of the software and the studies for blind and partially sighted people community. So that was also very challenging for me to deal with all of this and also dealing with funding and extending deadlines and all of this together but hopefully i made it um, so far and i'm looking forward to finish it by the end of the summer and um, so uh, that was my uh, presentation thank you very much for listening now i would like to introduce ed who will talk about his work as the development lead at royal institute of navigation Thanks for that. Um, so I'm just going to give a, um, a brief overview of professional registration um, at the Royal Institute. It's the uh, part of um, my job role is to uh, look after and help people through their applications for becoming um, chartered engineers and similar. So you have kind of three paths through professional registration. Um, with the RIN, so it's got almost a tiered system. So you've got an ING, an ENG tech, or a C ENG. So why you may choose to do um, your professional registration through the RIN if you're working in an industry that's kind of based in navigation, um, we've kind of constructed a um, a scheme of how to get you from necessarily not knowing what to do with your application you might you might know about you know becoming a C -Eng or something like that or you might be coming from it from a completely new perspective and and uh, be wanting to be told as much as you can about it so um, we've kind of created these the, the forms that you have to fill in and we like to walk every one of our members who are going through it um, we like to walk them through it um, as educatedly as you possibly could do really. So the steps to uh, registering, um, our current system is um, you'll contact me first, Ed, at the RIN. Um, and then we have a series of mentors who have recently been through the um, scheme with us. So they know what they're talking about. 
and we'll assign a new um, applicant to a mentor who will go through you know all the different things you need that come together to make an application. The main body of that application will be something called a QRF form, which is basically a form which gets certain competencies that you have to fill in. It's a bit kind of like a, a very kind of long CV where they're asking you the questions. So you'll have certain sections which require you to write down your certain experiences in those sections. So your competency areas are here. So section A, knowledge and understanding. So this is probably the most general part of the form. So you would have things here. Um, you, you would look at it as in, you'd be trying to describe why why your relevant experiences fit in with each one of these competencies basically um, so as i say it is quite similar to a cv um, and then at the end of all of that you have a technical task to fill in um, with your cng form so you'll you have two sides of a4 to write about a technical task in as much detail as you possibly can um, and that goes forward towards your application um, so along alongside that, of course, you'll have to put in a CV. Um, there's a, another application form you have to fill in. Um, and the whole point of doing it possibly with RIN is because we've got, as I say, mentors who will go through those forms with you. Um, the likelihood of you getting it right first time is, is unlikely, but not unheard of. Um, so they will you know, look at your form after helping you fill it in. You have go off, have a go, fill it in send it back to your mentor. The mentor will look at the form um, and make any sort of corrections that they think, you know, you could you could do to it to make it, you know, as solid as possible. And then that'll happen a few times. And then once everyone's happy with it, all of the information will be sent off to me. And then we'll send that off to the um, Aeronautical Society who we do our professional registration with. But one of the really most important things um, with the engineering council at the moment when it comes to professional registration is they're looking for things such as we can see on the slide so complying with codes of conduct managing and applying safe, safe systems of work undertaking engineering activity in a way that contributes to sustainable development so that's quite a relatively new thing to the the qrf forms um, and we're about to have a new version of these QRF forms available to people who are um, applying for their professional registration through the RIN. All of uh, this information above um, can be found on our website. Um, but what I would suggest, apart from you know, go onto the site, if you're interested in, in going down this route, I would suggest having a look on our website for the relevant information, which and trying to work out maybe where you might even, I mean, feel free to download one of the QR forms that's on there and have a go at filling it in and send it across. But um, it is my job to um, help people through this process. So if anyone has any questions or anything like that, feel free to send me an email and you know, ask me any questions and I can assign you a mentor or we can kind of help you through the process and see where you're at and what your next stage will be. So yeah, these are the uh, three qualifications that you can gain through the RIN. So yeah, we start with an Eng Tech, then you move on to a, an I Eng, and then C Eng. And here's a, a brief little snip of uh, the B part of the competencies. Um, so it's very kind of simple things. I mean, it's one of the the um, main reasons people sometimes feel a little bit kind of intimidated by the the process is if it when you look at the QRF form it's quite a long form and you think oh god I've got you know, a lot to fill in here but it is kind of put down into bites and bits and it's quite easy once you're in the swing of things to move on through the forms without without much trouble really and once you've done it it's only usually just a few 
tweaks here or there to get it to standard so we can send it off and um, see what the engineering council decides on your application. And then, yeah, this is uh, the final part of the application form, which is your account of a technical task. Um, yeah, so th this is basically a showcase of you explaining as much in much technical detail as you possibly can a task that you've, you've undertaken in your in your career. Um, and you can be as detailed as you like with it um, because the engineering council absolutely loves detail. So as much of that as possible um, when filling in that part of the form. But as I say, we have mentors and myself and we can you know, give you examples of what people have done. We can give you more information about what you might need to put in these these bits. But um, yeah, it's a very well supported part of the RIN and uh, we're quite proud of it. And finally, which is a new thing with the uh, Engineering Council, um, I say new, but it, uh, a more relevant thing now is CPD. So keeping a log of all the things that you do, a lot of things you don't imagine that you'd be doing in your career that you are actually doing, you know, going to you know, webinars such as this one or doing training at work and things like this, all these things you can add to a log of CPD, which when you're becoming um, professionally registered, you need to keep a log of those things, which you will send to me in the in the RINS case, and I will keep it on file. And it's also a very good thing to do in uh, your own personal um, life. So our final speaker is Anna, who's gonna be talking about publishing with the Journal of Navigation. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, yes, I'm Anna Rassir. I'm a professor of geospatial data science, but today I wear my hat that um, is a representative of Journal Navigation. I'm the editor-in-chief of Journal, and I would like to talk about why and how we, um, we would like to work with you, how you can actually contribute to the Journal of Navigation. Um, I, I will talk a little about um, the plans and vision of the journal and different pathway to contribute uh, to our community. Um, but the main reason that uh, we have the Journal of Navigation under the Institute of Navigation is because we want to have a pathway for an impactful research. You know, we all do research, um, and I guess most of you are early career researcher, not because we want to just do something cool. We want to have an impact on the society. For example, if you work on um, navigation of blind people, you want to improve the quality of life of people uh, with uh, some uh, partially sighted um, life. And, and um, it is possible that you want to work with uh, some subject that improve the economy or with the sustainability of the planet. We want to have an impact. And in order to have an impact, we should have a louder voice to say what we've done in our research, how we actually push the boundaries of science and technology. And so other people can actually use that in their daily life or in commercialized services or in their policy. And journals are one of the best way to disseminate your results because they are getting uh, peer reviewed. And so there are some experts who actually look into your work and help you to improve your uh, papers and uh, the result and make sure that it is rigorous. And so uh, it can be applied in the uh, real world problem. Um, I know that there are always some sort of um, level of disappointment when we get the, the reviews because, um, you know, it, it, they're actually supposed to be critical, nice, but critical. But I've never seen a paper that looks as great as the first submission. So it is great. Um, so Journal of Navigation is trying to improve that pathway to make sure that your good publication, good research is out there. And um, in this regard, uh, we are trying to improve our um, journal uh, papers in many ways. Um, journal of Navigation has been out there since um, mid 
previous centuries and it is one of the most leading journal in the area of navigation we publish in different area of navigation land navigation like pedestrian navigation uh, car and nowadays there are autonomous cars and indoor navigation maritime uh, some of the most controversial topic that we've seen on the news actually have had some sort of representation on the journal for example we had that missing flight for a malaysian airline and we have a very good paper on that some of the world changing um, research has been published, but the earliest work on GPS is um, actually within our journal. And it has been always a leading journal. And uh, that is why I want to encourage you to publish your result. I understand many of you are early career researcher, and so um, you may not feel very confident to do so, but uh, there are different ways. First of all, what is uh, being an author, but also there are other ways to actually be a part of the community. Uh, we are actively working with different type of people with different level of experience and regardless of your level of experience, you can be a part of that. Uh, so as I said, the first one is being an author. Um, for example, if in, within your PhD or your first postdoc, uh, you work on something or you just finished your review, literature review, you can still publish because we publish both literature review and original research. And even if you're uh, working with government or industry, there are pathways. Uh, we've got forum papers that have got your opinion. It will be peer reviewed, but they have got different sort of uh, audience um, uh, on the forum paper so you can submit your um, review papers and and we welcome that um and that is always open to many many people i remember the first uh, paper uh, that i published with the journal of navigation that i wasn't obviously an editor-in-chief at the time i went to the issue that my own line manager who is a really world leading scientist also had a paper so um so different people with different level of career can publish it the only thing that we consider is the quality of the paper so so all you can do is just to focus on your research and get the result out um but if you um publish with us you can also join as a reviewer i understand for early career researcher and if you're a phd student you may not feel confident but uh, i must say that as um the editor-in-chief some of the best reviews come from early career researchers because they they are at the cutting edge side of the the science and more importantly they spent a lot of time reading the paper even sometimes running the code again and that's uh fantastic so we get a lot of good reviews and uh the best part of uh being either review or author is knowing the the whole process of peer review so i uh, one of the things that i try to do is supporting early career researcher for example if this is your first paper that you submit if you put a note for me uh, to say oh I, I i'm just a phd student that this is my first i'm very nervous then i try to get first of all uh several reviewers to read the paper so you will have more and more feedback um and more important i try to uh, make the the comments of the reviewer a bit not not nicer but you know you want to get very critical but nice review so we don't want to just make it the last time that you try if even if it is rejection you should get very good feedback um in a kind of encouraging tone so i will always talk to the reviewers to say that okay remember this is a, a paper from an early career researcher so we want to hear them uh hear from them again um so as i said uh, joining as a reviewer is something really really useful for yourself so please do email me if you want to join as a reviewer because we can always assign the paper that is in within your area of expertise and that helps your career development because you know the process very well and at the same time you know that what we expect from the uh, the paper but even if you're not within the research community if you work in for example industry you can always read our paper so um, we are um, a transformative journal we passionately support open access and there are so many papers that you already have access to um, so read the paper that that's 
probably one of the most joyful thing that you can actually do in, in the area of research because you will know what is going on. Um, and sometimes there are some uh, comments that I receive from people who have read the paper and they've got some opinions. So we actually have got um, some blogs that we, we try to um, push um, and get some feedback from people who read the paper. They've got some comments in support or in disagreement with the paper. As long as it is factual and supported by uh, your paper, we, we would like to publish them. Uh, we also have got some interviews. For example, some of our associate per, um, editors have some interview because we want to have a very inclusive community. Um, so uh, you can actually uh, write some blogs. We are active on Twitter, so follow us on social media. Um, and what we want is a, a large group of people all around the world who can act as an ambassador for our journal and, and encourage their colleague and fellow to actually submit uh, their papers to us. So um, there are so many uh, information on the journal website, like instruction for the authors, how you can actually prepare your material uh, to submit to the journal, what qualifies to be an original research, how you should actually select your keyboard or so. and. Um, it, and you read them first, but if you've got any question, you, you can always contact me and I'm very happy to email uh, back. Um, so the journal email is there, but I also shared my own um, personal email. So, so I would love to hear from you. Please remain in touch. We would like to work with you in different pathway that I mentioned. Thank you very much.